Amen. Give another hand for your dad then. You can kill the video. <laughs> we don't want to watch it again. We got the first time. You know, the usual pattern on Father's Day is we come together and uh, spend time talking to men. On Mother's Day, it's kind of a, we exalt and praise and lift up mom and tell her how wonderful she is. On Father's Day, we just sit around and beat the dads up. So... Uh, it never amazes me as to uh, how whenever there's a malfunction of some sort in the church, people always want to look for ways to remind men of all their shortcomings and tell them about what they need to do. Preachers are no exception. I think it's my part of my responsibility to join the fray by chewing out you dads a little bit. <laughs> I don't want to break that tradition. So, uh, men, uh, spend more time in your families. Spend more time in prayer. Spend more time in the Bible and quit being a spiritual wimp. Can I get an amen? amen? All right. I feel better, don't you? <laughs> no, today I want to take a little different route and, and give a real word of encouragement to our fathers. You know, so many dads in our fellowship that are serving the Lord and being what God's called you to be. I appreciate you. Maybe you're not sure about how the Father's Day originated in studying and preparing message for Father's Day. I came across this little story of how, the begin, how it started, Father's Day. In fact, it was begun by a woman named a Sonora, Sonora Smart Dodd in Spokane, Washington, was where the first Father's Day celebration was. She was sitting there on Mother's Day in 1909, hearing a message to mothers and how encouraging that mothers were. The difference with her, though, that uh, Sonora hadn't grown up with a mom in her home. Her mother died when she was very young, and her dad had raised her, and uh, she was very appreciative of all that he sacrificed for her since mom wasn't there, and all that he'd done, and how courageous and selfless he had been in, in her life, and she wanted to do something for this loving, this loving father, this loving man that he was. Her father was born in June, so she approached the, uh, the Spokane, Washington City Council and the mayor about having a special Father's Day celebration. And the very first one was in Spokane, Washington in 1910, on January the 19th of 1910. It wasn't until 1942 that President Calvin Coolidge proclaimed the third Sunday of of June of every year would be set aside to celebrate our dads. So we want to celebrate our dads, and even more so to celebrate our Christian dads. I think they're probably the most un unnoticed, uh, uncared for, unpraised, unsung, unappreciated heroes of all time, the Christian father, the guy who is committed to the Lord, the guy who's committed to his family. Uh, someone said, well, you know, there's a little boy to find it when he said that the Father's Day was just like Mother's Day. But the only difference is you don't spend as much money on the, the gift for Father's Day. <laughs> I don't know, you and I grew up with the uh, father on the first few short years of my life and then was raised by stepdad. But there are some famous sayings that I kind of pinned out here that I think that most of us would be uh, understood, whether it's a stepfather or a father that raised you. Here's a few things you probably grew up hearing. <clears throat> this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. Be quiet. I'm trying to watch the game. You hadn't heard that. I don't know if you grew up in, in, with a dad. How about this one? Bring back my change. <laughs> the favorite, ask your mother. 
Another famous dad says, you want me to take you where? That was usually a daughter asking, I think. You don't understand, when I was your age, I would walk five miles to school, both directions uphill. <laughs> Turn off the lights, you don't pay the bills around here. All right, now, if you break your leg, don't come running to me. <laughs> I didn't quite always understand that one. Get down there before you kill yourself. On second thought, go ahead. <laughs> why? Anybody know the answer to why? Because? Oh, you are good. <laughs> or just wait till you have kids of your own. That was a famous one. Or better yet, just wait until I get home. My favorite was, last but not least, is shut up before I give you something to cry about. <laughs> Parental styles have changed since I was born. Oh, but I want to talk about a godly father today. And I, a lot of places we can go in scriptures to find a role model for a godly father. Obviously, the ultimate role model, as Jimmy was saying during our welcome time, is our heavenly father. We always look to him as what a real father is like. But in Joshua 24 is an interesting passage. Let's just go there quickly and we'll explain it as we go. But in John 4, John, Joshua 24, verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served which are beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me, in my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered, and they said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who did these great signs in our sight and preserved us through all the way in which we went and among all the peoples throughout whose midst we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the peoples, even the Amorites who lived in the land. So we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. Now, to, to get the full grip of this passage, this is Joshua speaking, who's been leading the children of Israel for several decades. In fact, he's 110 years old when he gets up to make this address. And it's a final farewell address. He's called all the leaders of Israel together to meet him at Shechem. And there he stands before them and he's charging them and giving them a, a, a solemn charge to realize that they're there by the grace of God. They've been given what they have by the grace of God. They're there because God has protected them and God has driven out the enemies. And he's there to remind them, it's the Lord who brought us here. Therefore, we shall continue to serve the Lord. You need to make your mind up. Why? I'm leaving. I'm checking out. Now, understand, fathers, uh, uh, ex, re, you know, just leaving out the idea that Jesus could come any time and take the church out of here and all of us who are saved be gathered together in the skies. Should that day be delayed, there's an appointment that every one of us will keep. It's called death. Joshua realizes that he's going to be departing soon and he's giving these final words to his children. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Make a decision on your own. I'm not going to be here much longer. I'm not going to be here for you to follow. It's time to grow up, make some decisions. It's nice to have all the things you've had, but what are you going to do with your life now that you have the things that you have? I mean, it's nice to have a good job, maybe work for a Fortune 500 company. It's nice to have a promotion to management if you get along with that way. It's nice to have increases in salary and vacation days and all the things that men can experience. Nice to get your dream house in your dream neighborhood, but understand you have what you have because God's blessed you. And you need to continue to serve the Lord. If you're looking at this man as kind of a role model for fathers, there's really just two points in this short message that I have to share with you today. Two points, I think, if you can get these down, it can really change the course of your life and your family. Point number one with Joshua, as, this, as far as qualities that he possessed, was this one. He was the priest of his home. He was the priest of his home. Now, it's responsibility in, in, in the Bible that in the Old Testament, a priest represented God to the people and people to God. He was that connection point to God. In the New Testament, the Bible says we've all connected with God, all right? We're all priests to the Lord. We all stand before the Lord. But in the New Testament, even in the sense of our home, a father serves in several capacities. And one of those capacities, not just to provide and not just to protect, you know, but to, to be that person in the home who continues to stand for Jesus and do just 
as Joshua is doing here. It's time to realize we're here by the grace of God and you need to make the decision to continue to follow God. He's standing as the representative before God. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, it's six, chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. These words which I command thee to this day shall be in your heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in their house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and upon thy gates. Now, today in Israel and many Jewish homes, these words have been taken quite literally as far as, you know, posting them on the doorpost and on your frontlets in prayer times. But the heart of this, Old Testament or New Testament, is the fact that, hey, it is your responsibility as father to be that person who keeps pointing the way to God, who keeps pointing the way to Jesus, who keeps reminding the world, the family world, that, hey, this is all about giving and following and serving the Lord our God. That's our responsibility. I was listening to a Christian apologist talking about some research that had recently come out. And he was saying, you know, and, you're, you're, and this apologist debated lots of atheists and, uh, you know, people who were non-believers and constantly presenting the facts of Scripture to them and, and arguing for the gospel and for the Bible. But he, he, was, he was making the, state about, the statement about the research into the lives of all the people that he'd been speaking to over the years. He said, most of these people that I debate, the atheists, the agnostic, the secularist, the humanist, have, uh, when, in speaking to them, all formed their world opinion, not in the universities, but in their homes. He said, usually by the age of 11 or 12, they said, most of them had come to the idea that this is the way they were going to believe this was going to be their worldview of a world without God and where man is in charge of all things. Isn't that amazing? That's why it is so important as a man, that our children, even at the youngest of ages, are hearing what Deuteronomy says. These words, we shall teach them diligently unto our children. That's why there's such an emphasis in our Christian homes for men to read the Bible and tell the Bible and speak the Bible and teach the Bible to their family. And I, you know, I'm all for our home devotions, but this goes further than just having a devotional time, doesn't it? In Deuteronomy, when he, when he shares this. It goes to the idea, it says, when you're in the way, when you're getting up, when you're going out to eat, wherever you are, and I think that most fathers in this room have realized that that's where we teach our kids, isn't it? Out as we meet the real world, out when we're in traffic, out while we're in the restaurant, out while we're at the movie place, wherever we are. Everything is presenting a lesson to be taught to our children. We're answering the questions that are before our children. We're, we're dealing with the issues that are facing our culture. So it's, it's not just a one-time sit down the day once a day for 20 minutes and talk to the family. This is your lifestyle of leading. This is where Joshua is. He's, he's coming now to, to bring it all together and say, hey, this is, this is the way it all wraps up, guys. Everything I've led you through, everything I've taught you, everything I've instructed you is to bring you to this point to realize, hey, we're here by the grace of God, and it is God whom we're going to serve. I read somewhere a, little, a boy loves his mother, but he'll follow his father. Those are important words. And if they're true words, in which I believe they are, then where are we leading our sons and our daughters? Some months ago, I heard an illustration and a story. It was a true story about a, about a, a humble pastor, a man of God who had a very young son who'd become ill. And after the boy had gone through extensive testing at the hospital, the father was told some very shocking news that his son really only had a few days, maybe a week at best to live. And so while the doctor's communicating this information outside the hospital room to the father, at the same time the father is weeping and asking for grace, but realizing, number one, his son does know the Lord. He knew when he received Jesus as the Lord and Savior. But now to sit down with my son, how am I going to share this with him? And how am I going to communicate this to him? He wrote that he went back to the hospital room and he sat down on the bed with his son and held him and caressed him and they prayed together. And then he gently, as he knew he possibly could, shared the news with his son that he only had a short time left and a few more days to live. And he asked his son, are you afraid to meet Jesus, boy? 
Are you afraid to meet the Lord? Blinking away the tears, the little boy bravely said, No, Dad, not if he's anything like you. There's the model. There's the heart of it. Because where will our children see Jesus first and where will they see the Father first and most in our hearts and lives? Joshua understood this. This is all about the Lord. He said, we're here by God's leadership. We're here by God's divine hand. We're here by God's sovereignty. And I don't know about you, but it's for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. The second point, he had a plan for his home. Not only was he the priest, he had a plan. The plan was what? We're going to serve the Lord. If you're looking for a plan to share with your family about what this family is all about, it gets down to this, does it not? To simplify it, 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 this is it. This is what it means to be the priest of the family, ultimately, all right? It leads us to this place where the Christian father sits down and says, you know, the Lord is concerned about us. He has a plan for our lives and he has a purpose for our lives. So if we're going to discover what that is, then this family and you, we, we're going to serve the Lord. And we're living in a day that, that, you know, tends to mock fathers. In fact, it's been going on for several generations now, it seems, at least for the last 25 years on the media and Hollywood and TVs and all the things that that part of the world would try to promote to the rest of the world about fathers. They're bumbling idiots, according to most of the TV sitcoms. They don't have enough sense to stand up and get out of the rain. They don't know how to relate to mom. They don't understand their children. They don't understand their daughters. They don't understand their sons. And the best they can do is fumble with the TV remote. That's pretty much the way they describe the male in the world today. But you have to understand that that's part of that flame that's, that's, that's flaming the, fly, the, the, the fires of, 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 of women who say, we don't need men, you know. We'll, we'll have children, we'll just, we just need a donor, we don't need a father. But according to scriptures, you need a father. According to the, the ideal life that God has planned for us in, in marriage, it's between a man and a woman, contrary to popular opinion. And a father and a mother are both needed in a relationship with children. I know you can go do your own thing. That is the world in which we live in. And that's the plans by which the world lives. But there is another plan here. And this is what, this is what he's getting back to. Here's what the Bible says is what Joshua We're going to serve the Lord. And here's the way God's way is. What we need is men. I, I feel and I'm broken hearted for so many of our single moms in our culture today and even in our churches today who have to kind of fill that role in both the parts. And we as a church, we need to more increasingly pray for them and encourage them and support them in their roles. But I want you to know God's design here is for men who will be men, who will be priests in their home and who will be the ones who set the pattern for the plan that God has for the home by themselves serving the Lord. These are Joshua men. Men who are willing to take up a banner, stand for Jesus and be what God's called them to be. Who stand not only for their walk with God, but also they stand for their families and their family's salvation and their responsibilities to their, father, to, to their children. That's a great role that we have come to as, as husbands, as fathers, responsible for the spiritual welfare, the physical welfare, the emotional welfare. And you see it modeled through scriptures in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Even in the Gospels, there's Jairus, remember? He comes to the Lord. And in Mark chapter 5, he says, my little daughter is at the point of death. I mean, here's a man who's broken for his daughter who's, who's facing death and she's very sick. And he says, please, Jesus. He's interceding to the Lord, come and lay your hand on her, that it may go well with her and that she may live. Not the only one. There's multiple stories. There's a story in John 4 where one of the, when the, when the royal officials come to, to the Lord Jesus, Sir, come down before my child dies. Others who came said, My son is dying. Please, Lord, come and lay hands on him. Those are just examples of men who were actively involved in the lives of their, the welfare and the well-being of their children. People don't just provide financially, but they're pleading for help from God to touch the lives of their children. God, do a work in my children's life. What a great Old Testament illustration this is Job. Remember the Bible tells us about a righteous man that Job was? In Job chapter 1, we, have this, we see Job moving and praying to the Lord. It says, it came about when the days of feasting had completed their cycle that Job would sin and consecrate them, his children, Rising up early in the morning, offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all, of all of his children. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and turned God in the hearts. Thus Job did continually. What's he saying? Job was continually praying for his children. Asking God to minister, to bless, to restore, to help. And if they've sinned, God, forgive them for their sins and draw them to you. So he's always in this place. Now there are some other illustrations of some not so good fathers. 
Remember there was the story of Eli, the priest, who disgraced his calling because he didn't rebuke his evil sons and how they were defiling the altars of God. He had a responsibility for their spiritual well-being, but he wouldn't correct them and he wouldn't rebuke them. And the Lord speaks to him and tells him, Samuel tells him, the prophet tells him, hey, there's a price to pay for this. I have told them that I'm about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. Therefore, I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or an offering forever. These guys were carrying on things inside the worship house of God, the temple of God, by worshiping false gods. And it's the one place that's offering strange fire upon the altar of God. What is that? That's where they were trying to mix their worship of Baal and these, these gods with the worship of God. And God had no part in it. And Eli is being rebuked because he wouldn't rebuke his sons. But also you see some very godly men who had some very wicked kids throughout Scripture. You know, it, it, it's hard to look at David. Now, David by no means a perfect father, any, more than anybody in this room has been a perfect father. But he made his mistakes, but I'm impressed with the love which he showed his most rebellious son Absalom. Absalom so rebellious he wants to kill dad and take over the kingdom. 2 Samuel 8, I don't have it on the screen, but listen this. And the king charged Joab, Abishai, and Ittai. These are three commanders under David, and he's sending them out to arrest his son, to bring him to justice. And the king charged them, and he said, Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all the people heard when the king charged all the commanders concerning Absalom. What did they hear? They heard the compassion that a father had, even for a rebellious son. Even for a son who knew that he's going to have to face the, the, the chastening hand of God, but he still had mercy in his heart for him. He wanted to see God do something in that young man's life. I guess that obviously we see here that as David or any other man, our children can disappoint us at times. But we never stop praying, and we never stop loving, and we never stop believing. I've told my kids, I don't care if you go to prison, I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to love you. I might not agree with you. In fact, I'll let you know when I disagree with you. And I may correct and rebuke and reprove you, but I love you. And what blesses me about our church and so many of you that I've known for so many years and those who've come on in recent years, to see the demonstration of love that you have for your children is moving. It is encouraging and it's a blessing. I've watched over the years, some of you raise your family and now their children are, your children are having children. I've been around here a long time. Amen. I've seen your children get baptized and now they're having babies of their own. And what has blessed me is to see that your children love you and are serving the Lord. And those who are rebelling are still being chastened by the Lord because God loves them. But what encouragement is to know that you have loved God and you have led the charge and you have led the way. I've watched you. I've watched you go on mission trips instead of vacations. Take time off from work sometimes unpaid time off work so you could go and support your children, support your church, support the kingdom and what God was doing. I watch you weekly give your money to the things of God that are important to set the example of showing your family, hey, it's the Lord who comes first in our finances. It's the Lord who comes first in our time. I watch you take time off with your kids for everything in the world from, you know, Awana's things and children's camps and church camps and mission trips and on and on the list goes to see fathers who sacrificed, who took the time to sacrifice for their kids. That's, that, that hero, in my mind, is the unsung hero of the day. That's the guy that doesn't get all the attention that I think that he ultimately really does deserve. You get up in the late hours. You bear the burden in the late hours. You weep for your children. You rejoice with your children. You've encouraged your kids. You spent time with them to tell them the real facts of life. You're the ones who told them, hey, I don't know about you, son, but it's for me in this house. We're going to serve the Lord here. We've set that standard. Amen? Once you become this Christian father, the world changes, though, doesn't it? I remember giving my life to the Lord and committing my heart and my life to him. Then following that, a couple of years later, getting married and several, five, six, seven years after that, having our first child. First one was a girl. The second was a boy. And they didn't give us a manual on either one of them. 
And I want you to know it should have been two different manuals. <laughs> Amen. For you that have both, you understand what I'm saying. By the time you think you understand, then another one of a different kind comes along. But you do realize if you're a believer and you're a Christian father, the importance of that moment, it's like when that doctor handed me those babies, it's like, what am I going to do with this? A joy's filling my heart, tears are filling my eyes. It's an exciting moment. And all of a sudden, it's also a breathtaking moment to say, I have a responsibility here. I have a responsibility. And I realized all of a sudden how important it was for me to be what God called me to be. And I realized that it's not going to be the same anymore. It's not going to be the same anymore. You know, number one, you don't get to sleep through the night. Number two, it's no more 10, 30, 11 o'clock Saturdays anymore. It's late Late nights and early, you know, late, late mornings on the weekend. Some of y'all miss those, right? Some of you say, I don't know what that was like anymore. That happened so long ago. And then when you get rid of them again, you're too old to enjoy it, so you just you get up early anyway. <laughs> Change your whole life and habit style. But, you know, we, you know there's, there's a joy, even in the hard parts of it, even in the crimes of the night, even in that nasty, dirty thing that, oh, wow, that child is corrupt. <laughs> that is the nastiest diaper. You know, I, I don't know if you ever walked in the room, it's all over the walls. You ever been in those moments? You know, those are hard. And then the, when they're sick, that's hard. You know, I, we were in Walmart one day and Joseph, he's probably 18 months old. He takes a dive out of the cart, head first on the concrete floor. You know, it looked like somebody beat him with a baseball bat. You go to the hospital and they want to write, call CPS on you, you know. Yeah, he did it. <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> Thought about it a few times, but I've never, never did it. But you know, there's still joy in those moments, in the heartbreaks moments. It, it, even when you, you're dealing with your children and perhaps there's stubbornness or doubt in their life about the things of God. But, you know, going through those times of raising kids as dad and walking through the tough valleys and the tough battles and the challenges that you face, uh, you, you see the glory of God. And even though they're difficult times, there is a joy in dealing with those things. It comes being this Christian father. I wrote this on that we understand it. Where it says here, no matter how difficult the challenges are for a Christian dad, he knows the heaviest burden is always followed by the greatest blessings. So you deal with the burden. And you bear the burden. Because it may be dark through the night, but joy does come in the morning. And you hold out for the glorious morning. And there may be longer nights than others, but you always hold out. And I believe when a man becomes a Christian and becomes a father, that he knows these things. So I want to celebrate dads today. In fact, I want dads just to remain seated. Now, like the rest of us, if you're not a dad, you stand with me and let's give these guys a standing ovation today. Dad, you remain seated just for a moment. I mean, give them a praise to the Lord. Come on. Come on. We salute you and salute our dads today. Amen and amen. You may be seated. I will let you know today, Dad, when you leave the service, there'll be ushers at the doors who have a gift for you. It's a flashlight. It could always shine a little brighter. It's unique. It's got a magnet on it for that steel plate in your head. You stick it right there and you read your books at night. <laughs> It's a bright light, but don't leave here complaining. It doesn't come with a manual. You have to take off the little cap on the end, take that little piece of cardboard out. All right, so there's no refunds. Just put the cap back on it. It'll work after that. <laughs> but we appreciate you, and we love you, and we thank God, and so we celebrate our dads today. We mean that with all our heart. Just a couple of things before we are dismissed today. I did tell you it was just a short message, didn't I? Amen. Sometimes dads deserve that. <laughs> they got to run home and cook lunch for everybody. <laughs> Amen. I want to remind you of a couple important things that are coming up real quick. One is this, our, our, Kim mentioned this last week about our Foundations for Marriage seminar that's coming up. This is in July, just a few weeks away, the 14th and 15th. If you haven't signed up for it, a lot of people have, but you need to get signed up for it. It's like a $25 fee. That just covers the cost of the continental breakfast and the, and the drinks and the things that we'll be sharing there with you to get to this conference. It's just Friday night and Saturday through the morning. Let's out at noon. 
It's only like five sessions in all that period of time. Pastor Strickland does the opening and I do the closing and Pastor Nick Harris will be covering the middle. For those of you who know Nick, you know what a blessing that he is. We just went to Belize with Nick and took him down there to cover that portion on families and pastors. And he did such an incredible job. One thing about Nick Harris that I always appreciate, it, he's probably one of the funniest guys. He's profound, but yet he is so funny. You know, your ribs are hurting when you leave. So get signed up for this. It'll bless your life. It'll bless your marriage. It'll bless your family. Come be a part of this. But more than that, I want to really challenge you what we did with our men's conference a couple of years ago. We challenged every man to go find three other men that he would bring to this conference and just pay the way. Amen. I would encourage you to do the same. I I'd, want I'd, you just plan on spending about a hundred bucks, pay your way and three other couples. Amen. Four people. That would be life changing for some families somewhere. So be praying about a neighbor, a relative, a family member that you could bring to this conference to be a part of it. You can, what you see done in their life can literally be life transforming. Come be a part of this. Now, the following Sunday, July the 14th and 15th is Friday and Saturday. On the 16th, I have a brief marriage that I'm going to share that morning about our marriage covenants and how important it is to understand the power of a covenant and, and the responsibility of a covenant relationship because that's what marriage is. It's a covenant relationship. And then those who desire to, been a part of the conference, can come. And we're going to stand here at the altar together as a large group, and we're going to have a renewal of vows service that Sunday morning. So I want to encourage you to do that. Come, bring people with you, be a part of that, you know, and, and enjoy this time of fellowship and this time of renewal. It'll be an exciting time for your own marriage. I don't know about you, but there's some times when you just need to do a little maintenance work. Plugs need to be cleaned, oil needs to be changed, you know, the tires need to be rotated. So in your spiritual family life, this is a good time for that. Hallelujah. So come and be a part of that fellowship and a part of that great weekend together. You will enjoy it. It's going to be a good time of the Lord. Also, a couple of things to remind you. If you're here today, uh, Dad.